let me start over. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Anna Krolikoska, your 145th president, and welcome to Parenting in the Pandemic program. Our um, speakers today are Amanda Zelachowski and Jennifer Valentine. And I could not be happier to be a part of this program today because frankly, folks, I need all the help I can get. So without further ado, Amanda and Jennifer, please take it away. Okay, I'll let Jen, do you wanna say something first before I jump in? Okay, all right. Hi everybody, I am Amanda Zelahusky. I'm one of the co-founders of Pandemic Parenting. I'm here with Jen Valentine, um, who is our executive director and uh, one of you all, a former Illinois attorney and member of your bar association. So we're really thrilled as life sort of comes full circle to get to be talking to you in a very different capacity today. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is just drop the slides in the chat one more time for those who have just joined. I will also have it on a QR code um, that I will share in just a second. If you want to download, there's gonna be lots of resources and such um, I'm sharing. So hold on one sec, let me get that situated and we will kick it off. There we go. All right. So like I said, um, we're here to talk about parenting. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on Pandemic Parenting, the organization, and, and talk with you about lots of resources that we have out there that might be helpful. Um, but my focus today is primarily gonna be on this idea of, of how the psychological science has helped us cope then and now. So just to give you some really quick context, I am a clinical and forensic psychologist and attorney by training. I focus primarily on trauma in my work. And so um, as you can imagine, I think it's really important before we get started to acknowledge what's happening in our headlines around the United States right now. Um, as a, a child trauma expert, I've been in a lot of conversation in the last 24 hours. This is very very heavy for all of us, of course, who are parents, um, who work with kids and families in these traumatic situations. And so I just wanted to take a moment and, and create some space to acknowledge how hard it probably was for many of us to put our kids on school buses this morning and send them off into the world, um, kind of knowing that we continue to have these tragedies happen on a, a near daily basis. So I want to honor that, honor the victims that we lost and just create space for some of that. Um, processing together. So related to that, I mean, one of the questions that I often start these conversations with is just to, to kind of ask you to reflect for a second. So, you know, thinking about what the last two years have been like for you, some of you are, many of you are parents, probably, that's why you're here today. Maybe many of you, some of you are caregivers in other capacities, right? Caring for parents, elderly family members, sick or immunocompromised family members. So there are lots of ways we've been in caregiving roles, whether or not that's traditionally as a parent or not. So I wanna ask you first to just note, if you don't mind in the chat, um, in one word, what has the pandemic looked like for you? What have the last two years looked like? If you had to sum it up in, in one word, and I'll just give you a minute or two to do that. Yeah, so you're probably seeing some themes emerge among your colleagues. I think it's really important to, to see that, to see these trends, to know that you're not alone in feeling a lot of the things that perhaps you have felt. So I'm seeing, you know, exhausting, frustrating, uncertain, lots of words along those lines. You can see in the word cloud right now on the slide I have up, um, when I recently asked a, a big group to sort of text in their responses to create this word cloud, you can see the ones that were the most common responses are the largest words there. Exhausting, overwhelming, chaotic, stressful, right? So for me, I would say probably my word is relentless. Like it has just felt relentless in a lot of ways that we have been trying to parent um, you know, 24 seven provide, you know, lots of other roles for our kids, teaching, supervising, you know, while trying to work and manage a lot of expectations amidst all this uncertainty, you know, which we're going to talk about. So 
sometimes it can feel like when we're scrolling social media feeds and such that, you know, other people have it figured out. I've heard this from a lot of parents, you know, recently, like, man, we're, you know, we're over two years into this and I still feel like I can't get it together. Like what's wrong with me. And so just knowing that again, you are very much not alone in that. And these are themes that we're hearing from parents all over the world. Um, so this was actually a series the New York Times did pretty early in the pandemic um, called the Primal Scream series. And essentially what they set up was within the first few weeks of lockdowns in March of 2020, they set up this Primal Scream hotline for parents, you know, sort of as a joke in the beginning, but really identifying like that's what parents were feeling. You know, they could leave a message, they could scream into the void on this 24 hour hotline. And you can see here some of these messages that um, people left of just expressing their distress and frustration and helplessness. So especially for those of us in a number of different caregiving roles, there are many aspects of this that have just felt impossible a lot of days. Um, but I also want to just kind of create space to acknowledge that this has looked different for people in different contexts. So I've really appreciated this quote from the writer Damien Barr, who noted that we are not all in the same boat. We are all in the same storm. Some of us are on super yachts, some have just the one oar. And I think that's really important to acknowledge too, that yes, there have been challenges for everyone in this, but that looks different, you know, depending on various layers of privilege at play, resources that you may or may not have had access to, support networks, all those kinds of things come into play in terms of how hard or intensely you may have been hit in different ways in the last couple of years. So these are just some of the headlines we've seen, right, to really sort of underscore some of these concerns. So half of Americans suffering from mental health issues, the kids aren't all right, parents are not okay. Um, so just, you know, a lot of these issues around, you know, grief and struggles and mental health issues that have come up. And so this is why, to just give you a little bit of background, we created Pandemic Parenting and, and how it is I came to be talking to you today. So my co-founder, Dr. Lindsay Malloy, is a developmental psychologist at Ontario Tech University in Canada. She and I were both doing research fairly early on in the pandemic, like a lot of social scientists, right? We sort of mobilized in the best way we know how, which is to study the very thing that we're perhaps most worried about in those moments. And so we each did studies on, you know, how the pandemic was impacting kids' mental health and parents' mental health. And as we were analyzing those results in those first few months of, of the pandemic in 2020, you know, we were both like frustrated. It takes us, as you may know, in the scientific process a long time to get science published, disseminated a year, two years, if we're lucky. And we knew that we were sort of sitting on information along with lots of our other colleagues around the world that could be really helpful to parents right now when we were trying to make more decisions as other phases of the pandemic were unfolding. So we kind of put our heads together and said like, there has to be a better way to really get credible psychological science into the hands of parents in ways that are really accessible and helpful in real time. So that's how pandemic parenting began. In, in the summer of 2020, we started to do some of these free webinars, bringing in experts from our networks, having them share science in real time, you know, as they were learning things in their studies, again, to really disseminate and, and translate the science that could be um, accessible. Uh, and the other part of that was really to try to encourage a lot of our colleagues to get better at getting out of our own way and, and getting the science and the psychology into the hands of people who could really benefit. So we're essentially a, a digital resource hub um, and a nonprofit organization. Our goal and our mission is to create resources, disseminate information in these accessible, helpful, relatable, incredible ways. There was some early media attention, as you can see there um, by the Washington Post when we began, which is what really kind of catapulted us into this, this global digital research resource hub. There's a lot of resources. I'll talk some, about some more at the end that I think will be specifically helpful for you right now. But just to give you a general overview um, on our website, you'll find really everything. So it's pandemic-parent.org, uh, all the webinar recordings. We are in season two of the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. We send weekly emails full of resources and evidence-based strategies from a lot of these experts. We've hosted, I think, over 60 different experts at this point uh, from around the world to really give you these bite-sized answers to frequently asked questions. You know, the things that Lindsay and I are Googling in the middle of the night as well in terms of how to support our kids and our own mental health as parents is what we're really trying to get into your hands. So I encourage you to check out all these resources. And like I said, I'll, I'll point you to a few specific ones toward the end. So 
let's go back to our basics, you know, why we started this, like how can the psychological science help us right now? So there's a few themes I wanna highlight in our conversation today. And those center around decision fatigue, predictability and routine and building resilience, both in our kids and in ourselves. So I wanna start first with this concept of decision fatigue. It's, it wasn't a very well-known concept or term, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, it's this idea that, you know, essentially we struggle to make decisions when we're faced with chronic stress. So the term was coined by the social psychologist, Dr. Roy Bomeister. And it's, you know, we've had this period now over two years of lots of decision making with a lot of uncertainty without clear specific guidance. And I think the thing that really exacerbates it amidst the pandemic is these decisions have felt very heavy, very weighty, right? Around the safety and wellness of our families. I mean, about the most important thing often we're tasked with making decisions you know, related to. So when we're traumatized or at a minimum under really extreme stress, we actually lose our ability to generate creative solutions, to make decisions. You know, we, we have that weariness. So we're seeing parents over all these months use words like drained, paralyzed, blocked, making simple decisions like what to eat, you know, what to do next, um, maybe in your work, which work task to tackle first can bring people to tears. It, it certainly did for me. It felt a lot of times like the little things are what really stopped me in my tracks. And it's because I had been making very big, heavy decisions all day, either for my family or for my kids. So when they'd ask me something like, what are we having for dinner? And that would be the thing that really tipped the apple cart for me. It was just hard to, to wrap our heads around, you know, why this was happening. And, and we think it was this idea of decision fatigue. We think that's a big part of what's been happening for people in general, but especially for those in caregiving roles. You know, as I said, these decisions that we've had to make in this sort of constant ongoing way, especially in the beginning, sometimes it felt hour to hour, certainly in my house, was just relentless. Is it safe to do this? Can I do this? You know, again, around safety and health. Um, I felt this this morning, right? Like my kids have two more days of school. Do I put them on the bus? Do I send them? Like, what are the conversations going to be about, even if there isn't immediate danger for them? I mean, that feels really difficult after two years, right, of trying to make um, decisions to keep everybody safe at, at a time when we don't know that we can always. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about what we know from the psychological science around decision making, um, tips, things that you can try that came out of several of our, our earliest conversations. So like I said, it was some of those easiest decisions that I have struggled with. And so these have been helpful for me. So the first is to not make major decisions when you're feeling dysregulated, okay? Or when you're unable to control or regulate your emotional response. So a lot of times for me, that's at night, right? I'm really fatigued from the day. I'm, I'm not at my best. I'm more emotional, vulnerable in the evenings, like many of us are, you know, when we're tired. So it's not the time I should be making major decisions because I'm not very uh, regulated, emotionally regulated at that time. So trying to, to recognize for yourself, like what are those times I'm more vulnerable that it probably just doesn't make sense to make a, a major decision. The second one is to try to limit the number of decisions you have to make each day. This is a great way to try to alleviate or, or minimize some of that decision fatigue. So for me, you know, I, I mentioned struggling around, what are we having for dinner? Part of that is because I'm a terrible cook. Like that's a very stressful part of my day trying to figure out like, oh, what are we having for dinner? It's, it's another thing I have to, to sort out. And so trying to minimize that, you know, we've instituted things in our home, like taco Tuesday and pizza every Friday. And it just takes away on some of those days, the need to even make a decision and everybody just knows. So the questions aren't there. We know where we like to get pizza, you know, every Friday night. So that really helps. I should have said in the beginning, sorry, when in my introduction that I'm a mom of three young boys. So I have a 12 year old, a 10 year old and a, a six year old. And so you can imagine in my house, that question is near constant. What are we eating for dinner? What are we having for snack? Right. When are we eating again? So that's been a helpful one for me. The third one is this idea of, you know, it works until it doesn't. We have this tendency um, in, in human decision-making to feel like decisions that we make are, are so permanent. So then they feel heavier, weightier. So I just want to remind you the reality that actually very few decisions are permanent or unchangeable. This has been a really helpful one for me uh, throughout, you know, phases of the last few years when things have been uncertain to just sort of 
sit down and, and recognize like, okay, this is the decision we're going to make right now. And it works until it doesn't. And I can come back and make a different decision at a time when it makes sense to reevaluate that. But just because I'm making a decision doesn't mean it has to be forever or that it's etched in stone. So I continually have to remind myself, you know, it works until it doesn't. And then we can reevaluate and figure out what will work for the next phase. So the next one is consider the risks and benefits of each option for your children. So one of the things I think we have a tendency to do as parents when you have more than one child is to make collective decisions for our kids, right? Rather than thinking about them each as distinct beings and what makes sense for each of them. So, you know, what can this version of my child do? What do they need right now? What can this version of me as a parent provide? And, and how can I meet those needs? for each child. Now, I know we can't always make different decisions for our kids, you know, for example, related to things like school. I can't keep some of them home and some of them not, you know, it just might not be feasible to make decisions at that individual level, but it still can be really helpful to go through that analytic process of, okay, what are the sort of needs of, of each individual in my family, including myself right now? And how can I try to best meet those needs in these moments? So next, consider how you and your child have changed over the last year, over the last two years. You know, this is related to that idea of, of what I was talking about, you know, not holding ourselves to the standard of who we were two years ago. I'm certainly not the same person I was. We've all done a lot of reevaluating, resetting. There, that's had some silver linings, too, that we've been able to sort of reset and be more intentional in our families and the ways we use our time, in our jobs, you know, those kinds of things. So just kind of considering how you, members of your family, have changed um, over this period of time and, and again, what version they might each need. Go easy on yourself. I'll, I'll talk more about this down the road when I talk a bit about grace, but, you know, thinking about this idea of decision fatigue and how that is layered onto the very heavy cognitive load many of us are, are carrying. So it's not just the pandemic, you know, there, there's already tons of research before the pandemic about how, you know, often one parent, typically the mom, most research finds, tends to carry, you know, be the designated worrier, carry this very heavy cognitive load, right? In my mind, while I'm talking to you right now, I'm thinking about tomorrow being my last day, my kid's last day of school, all the teacher gifts, cleaning out the things, like what are all the things, all the arranging I have to do and coordinating, that's our cognitive load. So then, you know, of course you throw a bunch of these extra layers of stress on top of the cognitive load you're probably already carrying as a working parent and it's just a lot and so having some some grace for yourself so this last one um of course comes from frozen too it's a, a mantra we've used on the pandemic parenting team many 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 times throughout the last couple of years this idea of just what's the next right thing you know we don't have to keep making decisions so far out that can often feel impossible and we just may not have enough information to do that so just do the next right thing and, and evaluate what that looks like for you and again, for the members of your family. So those are some general decision fatigue tips, decision making tips that come from the decision science. So I want to shift now and talk a little bit about predictability and routine because we know that that can also be incredibly important in helping us to cope when we are going through times of stress or uncertainty. So a few pointers for you. You know, as best as we can eliminate the fear of the unknown, that is not always possible. It certainly has been impossible many stages throughout the last couple of years. But when we can start to introduce little bits of certainty or predictability, sometimes that can be helpful. So that may be as simple as, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with your school activities next week, but here's when the school told us we will know. So that's going to be on Friday, you know, so I, I don't know anything yet, but it sounds like on Friday, we're going to know more um, and have more clarity. So what can we do to kind of get us from now until Friday, right? So things like that, that I can introduce little elements of control or predictability, even amidst broader um, stages of uncertainty. Connection is really important, uh, of course, you know, that we know that that really helps to establish, again, that predictability routine and sense of security. So getting to connect with people um, that I'm used to connecting with, even if we have to be more creative, right? We saw lots of beautiful examples of that throughout the last couple of years of, you know, Zoom parties and video chats with loved ones and, and finding ways to still connect, even if we can't in the ways we typically would. Maintaining balance. So I already talked about to, to, decision fatigue and decreasing that. Um, but a lot of this goes back to primal needs for all of us, right? If, if you're familiar with, you know, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this idea that 
none of us are at our best when we're hungry, when we're tired, you know, when those sort of basic needs aren't met. And boy, isn't that the case with our kids, which I think we forget. You know, I've, I'm guilty of that. Like I push them, we have to run these five more errands and then I promise we can get something to eat. Well, no wonder they're melting down because, you know, they're, they're hungry, they're cranky, all those kinds of things. So trying to remember, okay, how can I introduce more of that routine or try to stick to it as best we can? Um, to try to keep everybody, you know, at their, at their basic um, functioning level. Power struggles are another really good one that's helpful to try to eliminate. So I'll give you an example in my house, right? I know that, you know, bedtime is always a struggle with my youngest one. Um, and so ways to kind of eliminate the power struggle for the things we need to get done are now I'll say, okay, we need to brush teeth, get pajamas on and read a story which one do you want to do first, right? Giving him a little bit of control and, and decision-making capacity at a time when all those things need to get done, but do I really need to battle about which one gets done first? No. So that's a way to kind of anticipate, gosh, this is somewhere where we always have this power struggle. Um, how can I introduce a little bit of control and, and empower my child in some way? Okay. So then those are just some ways to kind of increase cooperation there. So a few resources and, and reminders and, you know, quotes that have been helpful to us on our, on our team and other parents is, again, reminding you this idea that it works until it doesn't. So even when we're trying to maintain routine and predictability, that might not work after a certain period of time, especially as kids are transitioning in and out of different developmental levels, activities, school years, you know, versus summer. So it can be really helpful to have ways to check in about what's working and, you know, whether it is still working or not. One of our favorite ways to do that is this rose, thorn, and bud method, which you see here. This is an infographic you can download from our website, share. I mean, everything we produce is free and publicly available, and we encourage you to use it and share it with others who might find it helpful. So this is a great one, you know, that many of us use in our homes to just sort of check in, you know, what's working, what isn't, what was a bright part of your day, what's something you're worried about, or what's something you're looking forward to, and that helps us evaluate how our routines may or may not be working. So part of what I think is critical to sort of underscore here is knowing that things keep changing. And as we are adjusting out of many of the pandemic restrictions in many communities, um, there may be some anxiety for your kids in that, right? They've sort of gotten used to how things have gone at least for their most recent time being, and now we're changing the game again, potentially. So we're seeing lots of increases in kids' anxiety symptoms. So I want you to hear now from one of our, our great experts who joined us on one of our podcast episodes last season, Dr. Jill Aaron reich -May, who's going to talk to you about some of that anxiety and keeping in mind how kids might need to adjust. If you are seeing or knowing that your child is very reluctant about going into spaces that you have deemed safe or you believe are safe, um, or they're vocalizing a lot of anxiety about those kind of situations, I would say first to start with empathy and understanding, right? It's completely understandable why people might be feeling this way um, during this time. It's understandable, you know, why this might seem overwhelming to you. Allowing just first the conversation to happen that I, you know, I see you, I understand, I think can lead to, all right, what, what can we do that will feel reasonably safe as a starting point? You know, I, I big believer in exposure therapy. And, you know, I think that sometimes you have to negotiate a little bit where you start, right? Maybe the child doesn't feel comfortable yet to be in a grocery store or to be, um, you know, in an enclosed movie theater or something along those lines, um, but might feel comfortable to go to a park with one friend and maybe eventually sitting, you know, in a library for one minute or two minutes uh, and then coming back out. So what we want to do is kind of think about what are like baby steps. Uh, along the way that will help us get back to, again, within a sort of a reasonable safe space, um, a more normalized level of social interaction. So, and I would actually, even just listening to Dr. Erin Reich May again, you know, I would actually encourage us to apply a lot of these things to what we're currently dealing with right now when it comes to community violence, school violence, you know, recognizing that there may be things that were previously normal for your kids to do that because of what they're hearing in conversations amidst their peers, hearing in the media um, are showing some signs of anxiety, you know, around doing. And it's it may be confusing or not 
occur to you immediately that like, oh, they, they may be worried because of this, or they may be feeling some anxiety because of this or that, that they heard. So um, here's another sort of infographic for you. That's just, again, identifying possible anxiety symptoms in kids, things to kind of be on the lookout for. A really common one, if you have young children, is um, stomach aches, right? So you'll hear a lot of kids talk about having stomach aches. And part of the reason for that is because kids don't necessarily have the language to distinguish between feelings. So where you or I could be able to tell the difference, of course, and articulate that between I have a stomach ache because I ate something bad last night versus I'm feeling nervous or have butterflies in my stomach or I'm feeling a sort of adrenaline rush because of anxiety, recognize that all of that happens in the same core part of your body typically. So kids can't always tell the difference. So when you'll hear kids in the morning say, I can't go to school, you know, because I have a stomach ache. Sometimes it's hard to recognize immediately that, um, oh, wow, that, that may be some nerves they're feeling, or they're feeling anxious about something rather than, you know, I have an, an actual stomach ache because of a, a medical issue. So keeping an eye out for things like that, um, avoidance of things that they, you know, may have enjoyed previously. And similarly, we're going to be sharing all today and in the coming days on all of our pandemic parenting, social media um, channels, tips for talking to kids about things like school shootings and violence. And so we've already started doing that and we'll continue to do that um, if those resources are helpful. So that's kind of the predictability routine, kind of decreasing some of these anxiety and uncertainty aspects. The, the last sort of psychological concept I wanna talk about a bit today is this idea of building resilience, which is so key. And boy, have we been learning how to do that um, the last couple of years, especially. So first to sort of correct a, a misnomer, and I'm gonna reference you know, one of our favorite experts who you'll hear from in a second, Dr. Bruce Perry, who reminds us that, of this idea that resilient children are made, not born, right? So we often hear people, especially in the media talking about, oh, you know, kids are so resilient, they'll be fine. But the reality is that they are not born that way. We have to model that, we have to strengthen those muscles, teach them you know, how to be resilient. Parents can help kids build resilience and confront uncertainty by teaching them to solve problems, you know, independently at appropriate kind of inappropriate developmental ways. So a lot of times, you know, our, certainly this is the case for me, like our gut reaction is to jump in and, and help or fix the problem. So the child avoids having to deal with discomfort, but that can actually weaken resilience. Instead, what we want to do, as Dr. Perry reminds us, is to be able to have kids in situations where stress is predictable, moderate, and controlled. So if you think about, um, if you have your kids in sports, right, there's very anxiety provoking moments when they, you know, come up to bat and everybody's watching them and, you know, the pressure's on them. If they are in a musical or a dance performance or a play, right, they have these sort of dress rehearsals and they have ways to, to practice in predictable, moderate, and controlled ways before they have the big show. And so this is what we mean about stress that is predictable, moderate, and controlled, that we are giving them opportunities to really cultivate those resilience skills so that when there are bigger crises, like we've been seeing the last couple of years, they have the ability to kind of cope and manage those and, and continue to refine their ability to be resilient. So if we sort of go back to expectations and, and basics, when we talk about how do we build resilience? I want you to first hear from Dr. Perry as he reminds us about how important it is to also adjust our expectations right now. Let's talk about expectations, right? And what you really wanna do is, is sort of focus on what, what are the core needs that these kids have right now? The core need is that they need to feel loved and they need to feel safe. And so honestly, you know, whatever it takes for you to make your kid feel loved and safe, whether it's like, you know, more hugs, doing more things with them. Right. If there are expectations that you feel are getting in the way of your child feeling good about themselves, feeling like learning is fun, learning is good, you should stop them. And, and you should notify your school that this is your experience, this is your opinion, this is your, you know, you just think that it makes things worse when you have these unrealistic expectations. So at the core, kids need to feel safe and loved. And that is, I think, one of the most important reminders we can have 
to again, give ourselves some grace as parents in this, right? We haven't been able to super parent the last couple of years in the ways that we maybe have held ourselves to previously. We've been just trying to get by and, and do the best we can day by day. And so at their core, kids need to feel loved and safe. And so whatever we're trying to do, kind of keeping that in mind, I think can be a really, really great guidepost. So another resource for you is um, one of these, another infographic we've created um, that came out of our conversation from a podcast episode with Dr. Julian Ford on trauma-informed parenting. And he created for us this idea of these ABCs of parenting during a crisis, which I have found to be incredibly helpful, again, as things have gone up and down over the last few years. So it's just another great resource when you are struggling in the moment, you have decision fatigue, you have cognitive overload, your child is struggling and you don't know how to help. This idea of being available, being present and, and having clear thinking as best you can in those conversations can go a long way. And another one of our conversations with the experts um, during a series I'll talk to you about in a little bit about building resilience, Dr. Michael Salter said to me, and I will never forget, you know, that children only tell us what they think we can handle. And that was so key, right? Because it reminds us of how are we regulating ourselves? How are we getting ourselves to a place of being in you know, being able to have clear thinking so our kids can tell us what they're struggling with. And I'll be talking more about that, especially next month when we get together together again um, on June 22nd for the self-care isn't selfish presentation. I'll talk a bit about you know, regulating yourself and sort of your own mental health so you can be present in some of these ways, but this is another resource for you. So along these lines, you know, when we think about building resilience, these are again, just some reminders. I already talked about, you know, that idea of, of kind of resisting the urge to fix everything, trying to allow your kids opportunities in these scaffolded supported ways to strengthen and cultivate these resilience muscles, avoiding the temptation to sort of put them in a bubble and make sure they never encounter any stress. Some of what can be helpful is, you know, our, our kids have struggled in ways that mean they're acting out in more disruptive behaviors. As I said, we've seen increased rates of anxiety, also depression in kids, aggression, you know, so it's helpful when your kids are showing behaviors that you're struggling with, you know, struggling to manage this idea of getting curious, not furious, like what's going on here? I mean, yes, this is frustrating. So if I can kind of keep myself regulated to really get curious about what might be driving this, kids use their behavior to communicate with us. And so taking a step back, calming yourself down, and then you're able to better access, okay, I'm, I'm, let me get curious and try to dig a little bit deeper about what might be going on here. Another way to really help build resilience is to catch them being good. You know, if you think about the quality of conversations you have with your kids, the nature of those conversations, I think a lot about how, you know, the, the hours I get, especially like on school days with my kids, what does the morning look like, right? As we're rushing off to school, typically hurry up, get your shoes on, get your coat. Where's this? I already told you, you have two seconds to get this together, right? Much of that is not positive, right? It isn't encouraging. It isn't positive reinforcement. And then what happens after they get home? You know, we're rushing off to somewhere or it's, let's go hurry up, have dinner. We have to do this. Did you do your homework? You know, it's, it's a lot of that management and, and nagging and reminders and much of it doesn't sound very positive. So I am trying really hard amidst, you know, my own stress to remind myself to catch them being good, like positive reinforcement. We have scores and scores of data to show is much more effective than punishment, than negative reinforcement. So the more you can catch them being good, you know, and instead of jumping right to criticize the things they're doing wrong, being ready and having those sort of positive goggles on to say, I really love the way you walked away from your brother right now, instead of getting into an argument. That was really great. Thank you for doing that. You know, it's a, a huge difference from um, the ways we typically, you know, try to intervene or, or punish. So that goes hand in hand with building kids' sense of self-efficacy, um, helping them feel mastery over things, feel empowered. You know, while I'm making dinner, are there little tasks that I can give you? Um, are there things that we can just sort of do to make you feel mastery over things, to feel that you're really good at things? Those are also ways to build resilience, especially amidst a lot of stress or crisis in kids' lives. And then lastly, there, this idea of embracing mistakes, you know, again, back to this idea, which I'm going to talk more about now of, of having grace. So I want to encourage us to make space now, as we have had to the last few years, but especially now, for the idea of grief, growth, and grace. So let me just start for a second with grief. So what is grief, right? It's basically our natural reaction to a loss. Often we tend to think about it 
in line with losing a loved one, right? Having somebody close to you die, um, but it isn't just limited to the loss of people. So the grief process looks different for each of us. Everyone experiences grief at some point in their lives. Some experience that more intensely than others. Um, so it's you know important to think about the different kinds of things we might be grieving. So we know that over 200,000 children have lost a parent or caregiver amidst COVID. Um, that's a big deal, right? So certainly that grief. But we also know that many of us have lost relationships, have lost income or jobs, um, have lost pets, aspects of your health, lost opportunities, you know, important milestones in our kids' lives and our lives, not getting to, to be there to signify those milestones. So there's a lot of loss that has happened. And I just think it's really important to underscore that grief. Um, so right now, right, we're, we're coming out, hopefully, of this pandemic, but we're also struggling with systemic racism and civil unrest, especially in the United States, um, war in various parts of the world, seemingly endless headlines now about school shootings and community violence. So the grief expert David Kessler noted in a recent podcast episode with Brene Brown, we don't even have enough time to count the losses we're all encountering right now. So that's why I just really want to underscore this idea of acknowledging, like, what are the things that you've lost? Um, what sorts of things are you grieving? Sometimes I've heard parents say, you know, they feel really silly because they're sad that they, you know, their child didn't have prom or they weren't able to go to graduation or these things that I, I know it can be much worse and people have lost much more, but that doesn't minimize the fact that you're feeling loss and grief about something that was really important to you or to your family right now. So it's important to in acknowledge those things because that's what help us move toward growth. So I just wanted to provide a, a few tips, um, you know, to start to identify, we've heard from a lot of parents worrying about these things our kids have lost or that you yourself have lost. How do I tell the difference between what is, you know, sort of typical grief and what is depression? And so these are some ways to kind of help prevent moving into that more serious type of depressive symptoms emerging. So a lot of them, you know, mimic some of what I've already talked about, making sure you have routine in your life and connection, increasing connection, often at a time when you feel like withdrawing from people it's ever more important to increase those connections, keeping yourself physically regulated. So as I was reading headlines of the news last night, um, you know, and putting my, after I put my kids to bed, I reached out to a friend and said, hey, let's just go for a walk. I need some like physiological regulation right now. I know it's 8.30 at night and it's getting dark, but I think that'll really help. And, and it really did. Um, so finding ways to physiologically regulate your body too and channel some of that frustration or energy, the outlets, you know, like that for regulation in different ways. Um, and then there's just a couple more tips there. So I want to share with you too now um, another idea from Dr. Perry around thinking about growth and how do we start to cultivate growth amidst a, a continued period of this ongoing uncertainty. So he's going to teach us a new term that I'll unpack for you a little bit. For me, it was as long as I know when the uncertainty will end, like I can deal with this for three months, five months, six months. I, okay. Let's rally. We'll make routines. We'll make this fun. What, but just tell me when it will end. You guys know what through hiking is? A through hike is the people that walk from Mexico to Canada. No. no. Oh, this yeah. is a thing that people do. It's, like, it's okay. like doing the Appalachian trail. So people that do the Appalachian trail, that's called through hiking. This is what okay. we're on. We're on a through hike. We're, and it's, it, there's going to be, we're going to get rained on and we're going to have beautiful days and then we're going to get snowstorms and we're going to lose, you know, we're going to fall and sprain our ankle and it's going to be com compared to a marathon, which is 26 miles of shuffling along. That's nothing. Yeah. We're on a through hike and it's going to take months and months and months. And I think our through hike, like I said before, I don't think the through hike is going to end uh, when we get a vaccine or a, even a year from now. I think the through hike for the people who really work with vulnerable families, that's going to be multiple years. So when Dr. Perry first talked to us about this term, I was really intrigued by it. Um, and clearly I had never heard of it. <laughs> and it still baffles me that people choose to do this. But, you know, hey, whatever you need to do, um, whatever your hobbies are. 
So I did a little research and actually ended up writing a whole blog post about this related to this idea of how we can continue to function as we move through this through hike, how we can give ourselves grace. So I want to just give you a few highlights. And if you want to read the whole blog, the link is there or you can access it uh, on our website. So there are some really significant you know, rules that through hikers follow. And so one of them is this idea of hiking your own hike. So through hikers really know the importance of tailoring their journeys to their own individual strengths and weaknesses and planning accordingly and remind themselves often that, you know, every hiker strategy is their own. And so judgments and comparisons really aren't helpful. We have had to navigate the last couple of years in our own ways. We've each had different twists and turns, um, bumps along the way. As I talked about in the beginning, there's been so many decisions we've had to make along the way, using the information we have at the time and, and just doing the best we can to make those decisions. So as I said before, you know, when you're scrolling social media or talking with friends and seeing wildly different versions of how people are approaching, you know, parenting or caregiving or being a working parent through these times, just keep reminding yourself that, you know, your journey is not the same as theirs and stay focused on hiking your own hike. Through hikers are also really skilled at, you know, picking a shorter trail when they have to. So sometimes, you know, we sort of set these really lofty goals for ourselves, for our kids, for our families, and our attentions are good, expectations might seem reasonable at the time, but then life throws us these curveballs, you know, like a global pandemic. And we have to adjust. We have to adjust our expectations like we've been talking about and, and try to go back and remember sort of who am I right now, this version of myself this version of my child, and maybe we need a shorter trail. Maybe that means we're not signing up for the summer activity we typically would because we just need a break, you know, and, and what sort of grace might we need there? Um, I really liked this notion of, of cameling up as a concept. So expert through hikers will take in as much water as they can at various points along the journey to sustain them until they reach their next water source. So think about for you, like what are the things that sustain you on a daily basis? Um, when it comes to parenting, especially right now, there's so many moments I feel overwhelmed and exhausted, sometimes hopeless. You know, that's certainly how I felt in the last 24 years, processing what's happening. Um, so, you know, I'll wonder things like at different stages, gosh, will my kids ever stop fighting each with each other? Will I be able to get my work done amidst all these, you know, hiccups in our schedule? And then I might, you know, sort of look up and happen to catch my older son reading very tenderly to his younger brother and, and I exhale for a minute, you know, that mental image is going to get me through maybe the next few hours. So I just encourage you where you can to kind of drink in those moments that will sustain you, camel up. I, I just really liked that as a concept. Through hikers also talk about taking zero days. So experienced hikers know that they need to build in days for recovery where they just forgo hiking and instead focus on really rejuvenating and replenishing depleted supplies. I think there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, maybe that means not reading news headlines for a bit. Maybe that means just saying, you know what, we're, we're doing a pajama day. We're watching movies all day today because that's where we're all at and, and we just need a little bit of a reset or sort of a mental health day, a zero day. So I encourage you to kind of think about where it makes sense to put your demands aside and just let yourself recover, let your family recover and reset a little bit. And then lastly, um, through hikers talk about looking for what they call the trail magic. So this is an unexpected occurrence that lifts a hiker's spirits, inspires awe or gratitude in some way. They'll often share stories of finding kind of what they need right at the point in their journey where they needed it most, where they least expected it. So, you know, as hard as a lot of these months have been or, or the months ahead might feel, there will be moments and people that lift us up. And so we know that one of the best buffers for enduring these prolonged stressful experiences is that support from others. So sometimes that comes from the most unexpected sources. Sometimes it takes us sort of opening our eyes and looking around to look for that trail magic, um, to accept it when people offer it, and then to be it for others when you're able to. So just some tips that I have found to be helpful is I think like, how much longer can we endure this? The reality is we don't really have a choice. And so where can we give ourselves some of that grace and build our stamina and resilience in the weeks and months ahead? So along those lines, as I said, I just wanna talk with you about a few more resources um, that are available. I only get you know an hour with you. And so that's not enough time to cover as much as I'd, I'd love to talk with you about. I also wanna note, I really love the, tips you're all sharing in the chat with each other. I think that's so great. And so thank you for doing that. Um, it just helps to know ideas other people might have because 
We lose our ability to generate creative solutions when we're experiencing chronic stress. So a few resources for you. On our website, which again is pandemic-parent.org, you'll find things organized by your situation, your stage, the issue you're worried about. So we have things broken up and, and cultivated and curated a bunch of resources for expecting parents, for parents of babies and toddlers and on, on up through the different age stages. Maybe what you're sort of worried about, what you're searching, you know, you're worried about screen time, you're worried about guilt. Um, type it in the search box. Odds are there's probably a resource there for you. If you're a single parent, if you're a working parent, um, you know, different capacities you might work in. So we've organized things hopefully to make it most accessible for you. A couple recent podcast episodes that might be especially helpful or, um, you know, relevant. So we've got one on parent mental health. Father's Day is coming up. We've got a couple episodes specifically for fathers, if that's helpful to you. Um, you know, maybe you have a child with a disability of some sort. We also have an episode for parents who have disabilities parenting right now, um, dealing with postpartum depression and anxiety for a lot of new parents. The episodes we're working on right now for next month is focused on people who have been trying to become parents or were pregnant or gave birth during the pandemic. So stay tuned for those. Again, you know, we just sort of came off of Mother's and Father's Day, so a couple resources for you. There's a quick self-care playlist for moms. There's one for dads. You've seen a couple of these clips I've been sharing you, these like one to two minute kind of frequently asked questions or tips from our experts. You can find all of those on our YouTube channel. There's over 150 of them that are, are hopefully just quick bite-sized, you know, tips for you or, or reminders or affirmations. Infographics I've mentioned, so here's a few more examples. You can find all of this stuff on our website, along with some more blogs. Um, and I wanted to just encourage you, you know, the mission of our work is to get this stuff out to people who need it, to vulnerable parents and families. And so um, I'm so honored to get to talk with you today. And I really just encourage you to help us keep sharing these resources. And here are some ways to do that. You can share everything, right? Everything on our website, on our social media. Um, if you sign up for our email list, you'll get those resources. Everything is, as I said, free and publicly available. Use these resources with your clients, with your families, with your friends, in your mom's groups or dad's groups, you know, facilitate conversations. Um, you can also leave us a voicemail that we can use in one of our podcasts where you're asking a question or just sharing a story or a reflection on something that was really hard for you, or maybe a silver lining that you've found over the last couple of years. And then another way to support us would be to contribute. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're really focused in the next few months on translating our most popular resources into Spanish to get them into even more vulnerable communities, into more parents' hands. So um, any support that you can give to the organization will go right to that translation project. So those are some ways to support us. These are our social media channels. You have everything in the slides, which again, I'll put up the QR code again in just a second, and the slides are in the chat. The other resources I wanted to mention, particularly in light of the headlines the last few days, um, are a collaborative project we did with the University of Connecticut School of Medicine called Roadmap to Resilience, Supporting Children Experiencing Stress and Trauma. So this was a, an audio series or podcast series that you can find, all of the episodes you can find on all podcast players or by going to roadmaptoresilience.org. Um, there's a number of infographics there, some more of those sort of quick one to two minute expert clips. These are examples of some of the infographics um, that you'll find there, particularly for those of you who might work with families or kids who have experienced significant stress or trauma in their lives. And especially why I wanted to bring this to your attention is because of our 17 episodes, there's two that I think could be especially helpful for you. Of course, the first one is how parents can foster resilience a lot of kids are struggling right now um, in ways you might not even realize. So I really encourage you to check out that episode. Certainly all of them, the beginning ones on what is trauma, what is resilience. You're gonna hear from 16 different experts from around the world um, about how parents can foster resilience. But the other one I'm really proud of that I think would be so helpful for you is the one we specifically did for lawyers in the legal system. So a lot of you work with families, with kids, um, you know, in family court, in juvenile court, in just lots of different capacities. So I think that episode in particular could be helpful to you. And please let us know what you think of it. And, you know, um, leave a review, send us an email, let us know what other resources might be helpful for your community. So I'll leave you with one more thought from one of our experts before I, you know, sign off and, and we have some time for questions, which is um, Dr. Christina Grange reminding us that 
We're showing our kids how to get through adversity better than we can tell them. As hard as the last two years have been, we've also um, just had this these opportunities where our kids are watching us. And, and though we may feel like we're failing in lots of ways, we may feel all that parent guilt, like I'm not showing up in the ways I would like to, I'm really stressed, you know, because of balancing all these things, you'd be surprised at how your kids remember these last few years and especially what they're learning by watching how you're dealing with crisis and stress and regulating yourself. It's really pretty remarkable the education they are getting about their parents' resilience right now, which is modeling for them how also to cultivate some of these resilient skills. So I will end there. I'll leave that QR code up for just a second um, while you think about any questions you might have. I see that Kim's asked for you know, people to turn on cameras. I'd, I'd love to engage with you, answer questions. Um, yeah. I'll give you a second to collect your thoughts. Oh, I love that tip from Mark in the chat. I'm just catching up and, and reading some of the things you all have been writing that yes. So Mark notes to complement kids process instead of the results. So for example, with their art, you know, I love how you painted the pictures and the colors versus commenting on a, a trait. You know, we do this a lot. This is related to the idea of, of growth mindset. Instead of saying to kids, you know, you're a smart kid, right? We talk about, I really love the way you tried to do that or you came back to it again. Um, I think art is especially one of those fun conversations with kids, especially young kids. I find this a lot with my kindergartners writing in art. Like our tendency is, you know, oh, what is that, right? And to them, it's so obvious, like how can you not know that's a tree mom? Like clearly that's a tree. And it's so, I have learned over the years instead to say, tell me about your picture. So then it invites them to tell me that's a tree so I don't make that mistake. Um, so I love that tip, thanks Mark. Other questions or, or thoughts or just comments? Please feel free to unmute yourself. You are, are more than welcome to. I had a question. Um, so I have a 13-year-old uh, and a 12-year-old. And they've reverted to, like, never leaving the house with their friends. Like, they just, why would they go outside and talk to people in person when they can just text on the phone? Yeah. And when we, oh, we'll take away your phone, that doesn't solve the problem. They'll just sit in their room. I, how do we foster, like, just leave the house, Jesus. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's it's an issue we've we've seen a lot. I mean, especially as kids were sort of coming out of lockdowns and they just got used to that, right? This mm -hmm. became the default way they socialized. You know, we saw them sort of withdrawing from a lot of those things. And some of that I, I do think for some kids was, you know, social anxiety. Like there were parts of those quarantine periods that were actually a relief for some kids who may be more introverted, who may be navigating complex social situations like cafeterias, you know, whatever, that was a relief. But for other kids, it was, well, this is just what we got used to. I mean, gosh, do I watch my tween right now? I'm like fascinated in a terrible way at what they do on Snapchat. I don't know if you've seen, they just take pictures of like the ceiling and the wall and they just send these to each other constantly. Like, I don't even understand what this type of communication is supposed to do, right? But I, I am trying to understand. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to sort of dismiss it or be critical, right? Like, why don't you want to go outside? Why don't you want to actually go see your friends instead of that whole, like, get curious, you know, mm -hmm. oh, tell me what you guys are talking about. Like, show me, help me understand. Okay. So you're sending this picture. Like if I'm showing interest, it's going to give me a little bit of a glimpse into why they want to do mm -hmm. those things. And it may very well be that you know, your child actually really would want to go hang out with friends. But if the friends are like, no, no, you know, we're just, it's better to just text. Let's all just stay home. Like they don't want to be the different one. So right. I think there's a lot of reasons that could be happening, but some of it can just be, well, let's start doing things together. If there's another family, you're friends with the parents that the two families enjoy getting together. Maybe that's a way to sort of ease us back into some of that in-person hanging out that then together, you know, we say to the two kids who are the same age, oh, this was really fun. Do you guys, maybe do you want to go to the park tomorrow? We can drop you off and come back in an hour and you guys can meet up. So helping ease them back into that, giving them some opportunities to do that in a supported way, I think can also help. Um, I'm seeing, so I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Chaya or Shaya. 
um, asked me in the chat, you know, any tips on dealing with transitions back to daycare for a two and a half year old after frequent quarantines? Yeah, this is a, a great question. We're definitely seeing these concerns a lot, right? I mean, for the better part of your child's life, they haven't had much social interaction with peers. They've, you know, been pretty isolated. So I think a lot of it is just meeting them where they are, you know, helping to do that in dosed, moderate controlled ways. So not on the first day expecting your kid to, you know, go and be there for eight hours or six hours or whatever it typically would be. How can you gradually ease your child back in? So maybe we go together for the first hour. If the daycare is okay with me sort of sitting and playing and, you know, we're finding ways in these gradual titrated process to ease your child into that so that they see that it's safe. They start to have it become familiar gradually rather than this sort of abrupt, like, okay, I'm dropping you off and I'm walking away. And, you know, that's gut-wrenching, right? When your child's screaming and crying for you and, and you're trying to walk away. So can we do this in a more gradual process? And daycares are usually pretty good at helping you figure out how to titrate that. Um, but I think that can help, but also just recognizing I may see some pretty rough behaviors at home after that, because a lot of times it's, it's taking, it's cognitively and emotionally expensive for our kids to navigate those new environments for that period of time. So when they get home, often we get the worst of them, right? And this goes for any age. I mean, this is for your teenagers too. They've held it together all day at school. And what version do we get at home, right? We get the tantrum, the exhaustion, the irritability because they worked really hard. That's again, like I said, a cognitively and emotionally expensive process for them in the beginning, you know, so we may see some of those rough behaviors at home. So I would just say, anticipate that and be ready with all that patience, you know, for yourself and for your child as they are transitioning. What else? Yeah, I'm loving seeing Tiffany's baby too. So yes, thank you for warming all of our hearts right now with your little one on the screen. That is, <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, if you have any more questions, you know, I'm, I'm happy to stick around, but I know that it is also lunchtime and you are busy working parents. And so again, everything we talked about, you know, um, you have the slides, please go to our, our website, access things, share them with others, let us know how we can be helpful. I'll be back with you on June 22nd, you know, which is a Wednesday again at 12 PM to talk about um, why self-care isn't selfish and how you can fit it into your very busy lives in maybe ways that you haven't thought about before. Thank you, Amanda. This has been wonderful. And I know personally that I needed this. So thank you. And thank you to this community for sharing all of your tips that I will be filing away. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Take good care. <laughs>